the Welcome day. to session one. All right, we're going to do preparing the shoeing plan, how to assess the horse in relationship to its conformation, both statically and dynamically. Okay, there's an important aspect of the shoeing plan, okay, because we need to be able to account for and accommodate any slight conformation defects that are within the horse that will affect the loading of its feet because ideally at the end of the process we, as near as possible we want to have created an even loading platform of the foot for the animal's weight. The first and most important thing for this process is to take a bit of history. We've already had a conversation with the owner here and this horse is a 13 year old Belgium Cross Irish bred sports horse. It's doing low level eventing. It's about 16.2, weighs about 550 kilos. It's a little bit overweight at the moment because it's been out of work with a couple of lameness issues. It's had a vet assessment and where it was found to be lame left hind with a suspected stifle and proximal suspensory issue and there is a suspicion of a left fore lameness in front which may or may not be related to the navicular apparatus although it hasn't blocked out and there's no confirmation of that diagnosis to help visualize this assessment you'll notice that we've covered this horse in little pink and white dots they are to primarily focus your attention on the center of joints because in our shoeing plan, what we're hoping to do is make sure that they line up with what we consider to be ideal conformation. That ideal conformation is the line diagrams that you see in many textbooks. And what we're doing here is comparing what we see on the horse through these dots to that line diagram that's purported to be ideal conformation. Although you don't find many horses with that kind of ideal conformation, our objective is to try and get this to work biomechanically as efficiently as we can towards that ideal model, which is related to loading of the limbs and function of the limbs during the stance phase and the swing phase. Okay. Okay. So coming to the forelimb, looking at it from a lateral aspect, okay, we need, or what we perceive to be normal or the optimum is that the shoulder angle matches the phalangeal axis, okay? And the phalangeal axis is through the center of the phalanges, okay, and the hoof wall, the center of the phalanges and the heel should match this shoulder angle. In relationship to that, the forelimb should be stacked squarely underneath the centre of the scapula, coming down through the centre of the carpus, centre of the fetlock, and that line should fall back here to approximately the last weight bearing point of the heel. Now, we can see here on this example that although it stood relatively square, if you look at the phalangeal axis, it's actually broken back, the pastern is up, and although the hoof has got six weeks growth on it, what's happening here, because the hoof wall has migrated dorsally, in order to relieve pressure off the back, there's tension on the deep flexor tendons, which are pulling the phalanges forward to take weight out of the back of the heels. What the horse is trying to do in its general posture and stance is to move what's called its point of force forward so that it's underneath this line of load. Looking at the horse from in front, an imaginary line from the point of shoulder here should fall to the ground and bisect the limb equally in half through the centre of the joint, through the centre of the knee, centre of the fetlock, centre of the coffin joint and have an equal amount of hoof wall either side of this central longitudinal axis. 
when we look at this horse, you can see that it gives the appearance of toe in. And that the hoop capsule is displaced medially. So it's a slight carpal virus, fetlock valgus. Now the question is, is this confirmation or is this postural adaptation for the way that it's loading through the foot and therefore the soft tissue structures? One of the things that I do to check the severity of any conformational defect down there is to match over if we could yep. and bring the limb forward and allow it to hang freely from under the knee. Make sure that you keep the limb aligned with the axis of the spine, that it's free from any tension, and then look over the knee, down through the fetlock, and as you look down that, what you should see is an equal amount of foot out of side of these pink dots. If you want to come over there, and you can quite clearly see that in actual fact this limb is a lot straighter than it appears what, during the stance phase. Those dots pretty much line up. So this may be postural adaptation from a mediolateral hoofing balance. We're talking here about this broken hoof past an axis, okay? And you can clearly see that this is not in alignment with the hoof, and it's certainly not in alignment with the shoulder. where the tendon is pulling, the deep flexor tendon is pulling back up the phalanges and the superficial flexor tendon is pulling it forward to move its point of force further forward so that the limb low from the center of this massive limb is further forward towards the point of force which is in the foot about there. And so it's trying to relieve pressure off the back of the heel area. It's not a confirmation defect. Again, postural adaptation. You often see this coupled with, if I just move this forward, you often see this coupled with it standing back underneath itself and slightly broken forward at the knee. Again, trying to shift the, the weight from this mass of this bony column as far forward into the um, dorsal proximal coffin joint here, okay, which is roughly related to its point of force during loading. I'm round through the hind and try and get as clear a view as you can, looking at the centre of the knee, down to the ergot, down to the heels, and that should be a straight line that equally divides the heels in half representing even loading through the foot medialaterally. And again here from this view, okay, we've got this impression of this uh, fetlock virus, carpal valgus, and the line, the weight falling line is over the medial heel. And you can see, even from this view there, stay where you have me, that as you look at the hoof, the medial heel is actually closer to the central line of the axis of the bone column than is the lateral heel, but you can see a lot more medial toe than you can lateral toe and quarter. So this distortion is predominantly within the hoof capsule. Okay. Again, looking at it from a lateral aspect, what we're looking for is the same sort of thing, so that the mass of the weight of the hind limb is falling down through the centre of the joints, through the hock, through the fetlock, to the last weight bearing point of the heel. 
And you can see with this horse, okay, that it's standing what we might call slightly post-legged, very upright. It's very straight through the back. It's got a long, flat gluteal muscle pack, okay. And if we look at the angles from the sacroiliac joint to the hip to the stifle, okay, it's relatively obtruse. And the angle that's forming from the stifle down to the hock through the tibia is very upright, almost as upright as the angle from the hock down to the fetlock. So a very straight conformation behind. Okay, what that's doing, if you look here, is it's overloading the heel. Because the majority of this horse's weight is over the back part of this foot. So we're going to need in our shoeing plan to kind of compensate for this conformation defect. Again, we have to ask ourselves, is this conformation or is this posture? And we'll see that a bit more in the dynamic phase in this instance. But one of the interesting things here, if you look at the trajectory of the coronary band, in a relatively normal horse, this trajectory should project forward and fall just behind the carpus, which it does, okay? Even though the heels are being crushed by the overload from this post-legged conformation. That tells me that this is more conformational rather than hoof-related and then subsequent postural adaptation. Turn this way, mate. Looking at this limb from the front, Again, what I want is a nice straight line through the stifle, through the hock, through the fetlock, down to the foot, and the bearing surface bisected equally in half. Now, it is relatively straight, and it's in line with the spine, it's slightly turned out, but the reason for that is The reason that they are slightly turned out is the angle of the trochlear in the hock. It's rotated outwards, okay, so that this limb clears the forelimb as it's extended up into the swing phase of the stride. Okay, now then, because the limb is attached to the skeleton up here at the lumbar sacroiliac joint, its loading is slightly medial. Now the hoof capsule, which we'll talk about later, but the hoof capsule has got adaptive qualities in its compressive and tensile forces, which can accommodate that slightly increased medial load. But once you put a shoe on, which doesn't have compressive uh, mechanical properties, then that load is pushed back up the medial side and causes this foot to the point of force to be projected out towards the lateral toe which gives you that slight flaring and this more upright inside and that is exaggerated because of the effects of the mechanical properties of the shoe in a barefoot horse it wouldn't be as bad although it would be slightly more upright it wouldn't be as bad as a, this one, which is not that bad, but as some of them that you see. But the reason for it is anatomical. From behind, what we want to be able to do, again, is take a line from the point of buttock here that lines up with the lumbar sacroiliac here. So the lumbar sacroiliac through the point of hip there, down through the limb, should be a relatively straight line through the joints and again bisecting the ground bearing surface equally in half. This is a reasonably straight 
confirmation on this horse. You know, it, from a, a medial lateral kind of point of view, it's pretty decent confirmation. But lat, but dorso palmally, we've got this post-legged condition. So that's our major consideration for it behind. And it's also a predominant factor in the suspected proximal suspensory issue because the suspensory ligament is under increased tension here at its origin in this type of conformation. In other conformation types, like sickle hot, the suspensory is under more tension down here at the distal end, okay, which is why you commonly hear of different proximal sus different suspensory desmitis issues and the shoeing plan for them is slightly different. Okay, we brought the horse outside, we're going to do a dynamic assessment, walk and trot. It's important that what you look for is footfall, foot flight, but you need to look at that in three directions. Away from you, to you, and from the side. So ideally you want to be positioned in, in a way so that you can see the visual triangle so you can see it going away from you, towards you, and from the side. Away from you, you're looking at foot flight. Towards you, you're looking at foot fall. And from the side, you're looking at stride length and pattern. So I'm going to go and stand over there on the pavement in the middle. I'm going to get this horse to walk up and down the center line of this road. And I should be able to pick up those three views. Alright, so from this view here on the side, I'm looking at stride length and as it goes past me, I'm going to walk up behind it I'm looking at foot position and tracking Okay And then as it turns round I'm now looking at foot fall As I look at it, it's landing reasonably level It's moving reasonably straight And then from the side Again, I'm looking at stride length and stride pattern. And at the trot, I'm going to look at exactly the same things, but just a slightly faster gait. Okay, and trot, please. Okay. Reasonably symmetrical. Okay, but it looks to me slightly lame. Right hind and le right fore and left hind. Okay, lovely. All right. 